Hi, uh, Neil here, back again with uh, um, Rock Our World. Forgot what I was. <laughs> um, the third edition to the to the new search for the new moon festival. Um, try and just, it, there are so many components to this. It's really hard to time all together. But uh, keep asking the Holy Spirit to bring all the pieces enough so that the viewer could uh, follow you know, well enough and carry on where I left off. Um, so I got all these components and the, the New American Standard version uh, uh, had this, what I'll say, uh, translated correctly, uh, referring to this, the second day of the new moon. But this whole event in, uh, in um, 2 Samuel chapter 20 lasted two days and it was the new moon festival. And then when I finally got my JPS a few years later, uh, they said the same thing. You know, they concurred that this is the second, first, in, first day of the new moon and the second day of the new moon. So, in other words, what God calls the day of the new moon can be either one day long or two day long, two days long. And for all I know, it could be three, but uh, that's a road I still have to uh, cover because uh, I'm in the learning process. But uh, I'm suspicious because in the seven years that I was watching the moon, you know, and God was teaching me how this cycle worked, and, you know, uh, I was starting with nothing, so, you know, I was kind of self-taught, well, taught by the Holy Spirit. And uh, there were a f two or three times where it seemed like the new moon lasted three days long. Uh, the, last, the last time being the week before we left for Gary, South Dakota, uh, for the Fe Feast of Tabernacles last fall. And uh, there was a big kerfuffle there because um, in within the Messianic movement, you know, which I didn't know this, I had been out of the loop for 10 years, they were really getting upset about the New Moon Festival and about the calendar and and uh, some other things. And in fact, uh, the organizers said, okay, there'll be no talking about the New Moon festival or the calendar because it's just point of contention and I was really disappointed because I went there all revved up to share this with everybody anyway I'm uh, getting ahead of my story so I'm starting to realize hey uh, what God says a day isn't necessarily what I think is a day a paradigm uh, it and actually what a day is is from the, the sign that makes it start to the sign that makes it end and, I, you know, I, I'm jumping ahead of the story because I didn't fully realize that uh, for another couple of years in this story. But I'm, I'm learning, you know, this New American Standard kind of got me going on that. And I think the book, book Jubilee started it by realizing, hey, just because I think a certain way and humans do doesn't mean that's what God, uh, that's what God does. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. So... I'm uh, kind of feeling like I'm making progress here. I can see now how Enoch's calendar of 364 days actually fits. What we think of as 365 and a quarter, well, that's not even exact. It's still not, still gets off a little bit. Uh, we had our leap year this year, 29th of February, which only happens once every four years to, to come up with this quarter day and, and kind of bring the the calendar back on track with with how the sun cycle but Enoch's calendar when you think when you realize uh, about this uh, day being from one sign to the next sign fits 364 and a quarter doesn't matter how many decimals there are fits because uh, you just start with one sign you end with one sign anyway I'll explain that a little further uh, before this uh, I, I'm pretty sure I can get to through this before uh, my 25 minutes, I'll say, is, a, is a, my cutoff, somewhere in there. So, uh, shall we speed the story up? I got all these pieces together, and I'm pretty sure the, the moon tells me when the Sabbaths are. And then uh, when the new moon festival is, it's the missing piece in there when the moon is dark. And uh, I'm starting to see more signs all the time. And uh, the Lord is kind of pushing me to do a, a word study on this 
this word which we called modim in the in the in the messianic movement it's a transliteration of the word in hebrew referring to what we were taught were the yearly festivals and anyway as i i did a start doing this study on 4150 and i uh, was resorting to my strong so it was a little slow i was doing some of these when pat was not there and uh in her computer chair over there and uh, I this this thought came to me that why wouldn't the Sabbath day be an appointed time I mean in in researching the word you've got the feeling that this is an appointment with the Lord you know the, the Lord saying I want you to show up at a certain time you know place you know I, I started comparing it to the idea of a doctor's appointment you know if we don't get there at the right place at the right time, we're going to miss it. And uh, so it's sort of like that, you know, an appointment. And I got thinking, well, why wouldn't the Sabbath day be an appointment? And uh, so I started this study, and I don't think it took 10 minutes. And I had a, uh, in Leviticus 23, I think it's verse 1, it says right there, these are the appointed times of the Lord. And it used this, it used this word, Strong's 4150. Uh the problem was with the old King James and the Strong's, well, the Strong's pointed this out, but this one word was translated with quite a wide variety of words. Uh, let's say up to 10. I, I could go back and do a closer study and get all the words, but that made it very confusing. You know, if it's one word in Hebrew, how come we end up with 10 words in English? Uh, but, you know, they that was a challenge back then. They, nobody knew Hebrew. And uh, um, King James commissioned that this Bible be written in English. And wh what do you, how do you do that when there's no Hebrew scholars? So they did a bang-up job. I mean, they did an awesome job coming up with the old King James Version. And, uh, but it was done 400 years ago. We can do better now. And uh, that's why I'm uh, kind of pushing her suggesting strongly that you get this JPS. It's as close as we got to accurate uh, to date, and I wish they'd do another one for 2016 and and also an Aramaic uh, New uh, New Testament. Well, that, um, inspired commentary. That's my wife's. Uh, so I'm hoping for that. We can be praying about that, but the Lord will do it in his time in the restoration of all things. Uh, so where am I at with my story here? I'm, I, I can now see how the calendar works, you know, the, the yearly calendar. I'm being challenged. The Lord's challenged me on this idea of an appointed time. So in Leviticus 23.1, it says right there, these are my appointed times. And the very first one he lists is the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then the third verse, if I got my verses right, then he restates Tell the people, these are my appointed times. Uh, twice always means pay attention. And then he lists the yearly festivals. So at any rate, I felt I had my proof right there. Yeah, the Sabbath day is an appointed time. Now, I still needed one more piece. And uh, perhaps it just wasn't quite the time because to, to have that last piece. Because I got in a pout for a year. Uh, I was so excited about what I was learning. I was trying to tell everybody. Nobody wanted to listen. They, it was almost like they would close their ears and run away screaming. You know, don't want to hear that. And uh, I understood to some degree because switching from Sunday, a lot of believers in the Messianic movement, they switched from keeping the sun, Sunday as a Sabbath to, to Saturday. They were ostracized by their, their friends, you know, the, the, the regular churches and so on that they were part of. They would start trying to tell this wonderful revelation they're having, and they had the same reaction. You know, the, their friends would run away screaming with their ears covered. They don't want to hear that. And uh, so anyway, that was quite a step for the Messianics to embrace this idea that, indeed, this Sunday worship was wrong. You know, the idea of Sunday was Sabbath, that's wrong. but And that the Jewish people have this right, that it's actually Saturday. So then I, you know, I do that for... 40 years, well, it'd be 32 by this point. And then God's starting to teach me that that's wrong too. So then there's the same reaction. So 
Pat and I were ostracized by everyone we tried to tell us to. And of course, Pat was more reluctant than me. You know, I was the big mouth. And uh, anyway, I was kind of in a pout for a year. Like nobody wanted to listen to me. Why was the Lord showing me this if I couldn't share it? And and uh, and then uh, in the course of this past year, getting it up to date, um, we had some money set aside for the feast of tabernacles. And we kind of hit and miss in the last number of years. You know, you really didn't know where to go to to get anything out of it because uh, the Messianics kind of, we got tired of them, you know, and they're squabbling. And, and uh, there is a lot of misinformation there. They had so much Jewish tradition mixed in with what they were teaching that we could see that wasn't right. And why, like uh, at our local uh, Messianic group, uh, recall us very clearly one day one of the the gals got up and she says in, in a midrash you know open discussion she said why why would we get rid of all our Chris, christian traditions and then pick up a whole bunch of jewish traditions and uh that didn't go over very well but her point was uh right on the money you know traditions god does not respect traditions of men um, they have some very small value but there, when we start replacing the Word of God with our traditions, we're way out of line. And Jesus talked about that. He said, full well, you uh, uh, keep your own traditions and ignore the commandments of God. So uh, the festivals are commandments. They are instructions. And they mean, uh, they mean things. They have huge meaning. The Sabbath day has huge meaning. The New Moon Festival does and the seven yearly festivals, all the appointed times of the Lord, which I hadn't learned this quite yet. This was the last step. I, I now knew that the Sabbath was, a, was a, an appointed time and that the yearly festivals were an appointed time. And I had seen in Genesis, I, at this point, this is year back, I had seen in the same study that took 10 minutes, the first place that this, this word 4150 is used is Genesis 114. And it says very clearly, it says that the Lord, and I think it was the fourth day, but he put the sun and the moon in the sky to give us signs for the appointed times. Voila! That was the piece uh, I was missing and that the Sabbath indeed was an appointed time. So in other words, Either the sun or the moon or both of them tell us when the Sabbath is. And, of course, Saturday doesn't fit in that, nor does Sunday or Friday or any other day of the week. The days of the week came from Babylon. Uh, the idea that the week is a continuous repeating cycle, seven now, seven and seven and seven and seven. That's Babylon. God's system is not the same. And it would appear at this point that it goes four cycles of seven in a row and then a break which would be the eighth day, the new, the new moon festival. And then when it's over, then you start four cycles of seven again and uh, go on, you know, uh, following the moon cycle for the Sabbath and the new moon festival and the six working days. Those are all uh, distinct uh, sections of time told to us by this, the sun and the moon, and particularly the moon in this case. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit ahead. And of course, I'm just trying to sort the information, try and match it up with the reality and with the help of the Holy Spirit. And, and the Lord's taken a long time doing this for me. And, and uh, you know, I'm in a pout. Uh, nobody will listen to me. And my wife's getting sick of me coming up with theories and and uh, telling her I'm, you know, 95% certain. I'm 99% certain. And then I'm back down to 90%. And, you know, she just got sick of me uh, saying this all the time. And she, she embraced the idea that, what we had given to us was wrong, but what was right. Uh, so anyway, uh, going back to, we're just getting ready for the feast, and we had this money set aside, and, and uh, oh, sorry, we had the money set aside, and Pat's on the internet one day, and, and we really like Brad Scott as a teacher, and, and Bill Cloud mentioned that, and here Brad Scott was going to be at a, the, this festival in, in Gary, South Dakota. So we look on the map, and well, it's this little spot out in the middle of nowhere. And, and uh, so, well, let's give this a shot. So she registered, and we were a little late getting on the premises, but we found a, a room uh, in a nearby town. And 
we showed up for the feast. But back the story up a couple of weeks, I really got a really strong impression from the Holy Spirit that I was to finish this study. I'd started a year earlier. You know, I was right in the middle of the study and I just got in a pout and I, I laid it down on the floor there and there it sat. And uh, I, I knew the next step was to find a scripture, at least one scripture that said that the New Moon Festival was an appointed time. And I, in my heart, I knew it was, but, uh, you know, it's good to have some proof. I already had the Genesis 114 that said uh, sun and moon tell us when all the appointed times are. In other words, we don't need a, an interpreter. We don't need the Christian church telling us that, uh, you know, when Sunday is and when Easter is and, and uh, when Christmas is, we don't need that. And we don't, in the Jewish world, we don't need the rabbis telling us when uh, the festivals are and when the Sabbath is and the new moon festival. We don't need that because God put the moon and the sun in the sky to tell everybody. All we need is the keys, the signs, uh, and how to interpret signs and when a day, what he calls a day starts, and when the day he calls a day ends. You know, the sign that starts it, the sign that finishes it. So uh, here I am, and the Lord's really stirring me up. Go finish the study, so I pull it all out. This time Pat has her new uh, program running on Windows 10, and I say, Pat, could you uh, find me wherever this word 4150 uh, that I would say means the an appointed time that would be my opinion of the correct translation of moedim anyway she did that well here it's used 200 times i was thinking it would be about 100 because i done quite a bit on in my strongs and it was very a very slow going but i was one thing that i wouldn't have learned if i hadn't done it that way is uh now a good program would tell me this too but because I'm computer illiterate, I uh, got my strongs. There was about, I'm going to say and repeat this, that there was about 10 words that were translated, uh, This what, what should be one word, uh, the an appointed time. And uh, anyway, these 200 words, the most surprising one was the tent of meeting, that my JPS, that's how it translated, but uh, the tent in the wilderness, the tent that the God gave instructions of how to, you know, put all these pieces together in the Ark of the Covenant and uh, all these details. And then they, when they moved to campsites, they'd pack it all up in a particular way. And the priests and the Levites would all do their part. And it was all very, very strictly done. You know, it was done in an exact way. Very important, this tent of meaning. But it was actually called the Tent of the Appointed Times. And I found that surprising uh, in one way, but in another it told me that that was where God intended to meet with his people on his appointed times. So anyway, uh, sure enough, it, it didn't take me long at all. And I found, uh, no, I should have got this scripture ahead of time. But it's in uh, Ezekiel, I'm pretty sure, 36. But if you if you read all of 35 and 36, you're going to find these scriptures. And in the JPS, it says this, that it says... Uh, uh, it refers to my appointed times, and he lists them. He lists the Sabbath day, the new moon festival, and the yearly festivals, all three. And very distinctly points them out as these are my appointed times. These three groupings of festivals. Uh, one's a weekly, one's a, a monthly, but not, uh, again, a paradigm. Not the month uh, he's referring to as the yearly calendar. Just like our calendar works like that. Our calendar has the months, January, February, and so on. They don't follow the month, uh, even though they're called a month. Anyway, uh, uh, then the yearly festivals. So, so the, these three groupings, the, the weekly, the monthly, and the yearly uh, festivals, are all the Lord's appointed times. And back in Genesis 1.14, it says, uh, The sun and moon tell us, they give us signs, that tell us when the appointed times are. So the trick then is to recognize the signs, and then you know, and anybody can do it. It's not, it doesn't get regulated by the authorities, you know, whether they're Christian or Jewish or or um, any other religion that may uh, proclaim certain festivals and so on. The Lord's appointed times are all given to us by watching the sun and the moon. 
uh, watching for the signs of when they begin and when they end. Okay, I'm at 20 minutes. Let's see how can I pack the rest of the story. Um, I, I'm just about finished. I mean, the rest of it uh, you can um, put together with uh, your own resources. But uh, I mentioned thir Ezekiel 35, and I, I may have one or the other mixed up. I should have got these scriptures ahead of time. Anyway, uh, can't do all the work for you guys. Uh, one, I think it's Ezekiel 35. I, I'll throw in the, the whole last half of Ezekiel is talking about the temple and its workings. And it's obviously a future time. So that is one of the, the proofs that I, the Lord, brought to me to contemplate or wrestle with this idea that that the temple service, the priesthood, and the sacrifices are not done away with. Uh, the only reason we're not doing them today is because there's no temple at present, but there will be a temple. I think it's possible from the descriptions of the last days that we will have a temple soon, and it will end up getting destroyed, and then there will be another one built that will last the, the thousand years. And I kind of think it's going to be destroyed too when Satan is re released at the end of the thousand years. And then uh, the final temple is uh, a supernatural temple, and it will uh, last for eternity. Nonetheless, those are speculations, and we know less about the things in the future. The Lord still has to reveal details of those things. But anyway, back to Ezekiel 35. Um, I, and I'm, again, I'm, I'll, I'll correct this on my next, uh, or give more detail on my next presentation. But um, it, it in one of those verses in, in that chapter 35 or 36, uh, the Lord points out uh, that there's a clear distinction between the six working days, the Sabbath day, and the new moon festival, that they're all separate segments of time. So in other words, the new moon festival would never be one of the working days. You'd never just stop in the middle of the week and celebrate the new moon festival. It would always be uh, separated from the Sabbath day and separated from the six working days. And that the moon would give signs for each one of those segments. And the sun. You know. So anyway, I was learning all this stuff over seven years, the signs, and I was kind of putting this together. Anyway, uh, the Lord was really stirring me to finish this study, head for the feast in Gary, South Dakota. And then I was hugely disappointed because the first announcement was... Uh, you will not be talking about the new moon or the calendar. <laughs> so anyway, I I went to uh, Gary uh, Dose. Uh, Gary, I hope you get to watch all this. Um, and he's a gr great guy. You know, we sat there and chatted for, I don't know, half an hour, an hour. And I expressed this concern that, you know, if, if the Lord indeed is teaching us about his uh, new moon festival and the calendar, that we don't want to... Um, command people not to talk about it. Anyway, he agreed. He just was trying to uh, avoid uh, arguments and contentions. And of course, those things come from immature people. And in retrospect, I would say that the people that showed up at the feast in Gary, South Dakota, were uh, the Lord brought them there. And they were mature people for the most part. And that they were able to talk about these things. And uh, I got into talks within hours of getting there. People wanted to know about these things. And uh, anyway, we got connected with quite a number of people that really want to talk about it. And, and uh, of course, we did it without fighting. And and uh, I guess we weren't following instructions uh, very well. But I, you know, Gary was trying to avoid fights because he'd seen lots of problems uh, coming from hurt feelings and guys getting a real big uh, bad attitude and leaving the fellowships and you know all kinds of nasty stuff but that's not how a mature person conducts himself uh, the Hebrew thinking of a good discussion and it, we learned this back in the Messianic movement we called it midrash and the idea in the Hebrew culture of a good midrash is you you present your opinions uh, everybody gets a chance to throw his opinion on the table and you get you get passionate about your opinion you know but it doesn't mean you think everybody else should adopt your opinion. That's not not why you're passionate. And uh, in our uh, 
most cultures in the world, when we see people fighting as we grow up as kids, we we tend to, okay, that teaches us to avoid things that are below the surface, you know, that are meaningful. Let's avoid talking about meaningful things because it causes arguments. But in the Hebrew thinking culture, uh, it was encouraged to have a good heated discussion. But at the end of the day, when you all left home, you're still friends. It had nothing to do with, well, I'm mad at that guy because he doesn't agree with me. I mean, that's immature. That's stupid. And, uh, or dumb. Uh, remember, uh, we say this once in a while and our grandkids said, Grandpa, you're not supposed to say dumb. You're not supposed to say stupid. So anyway, uh, immature. That's just immature to be mad at someone because they won't agree with you. And uh, that if you present your opinion with some kind of uh, intensity, that doesn't mean you're, you're telling that person they're supposed to believe you and change their beliefs on the spot because you're intense about your opinion. No, you know, let's not be... Let's not be so uh, easily hurt and easily offended. And let's, uh, let's have good midrash. And that's how the Holy Spirit teaches us things, by sharing things back and forth. Anyway, I think I got the, the basics of this done. I'm at 26 minutes, so I'll sign off. And uh, after I watch these uh, two last ones or three last ones, I'll, if I missed any things, I will throw them in and also give you you know, the exact scriptures there in Ezekiel 35 and 36, but you can find them. That's no problem. You have to get, uh, the student has to get uh, familiar with the Word of God and get really good with it. It's the sword. You know, we have to know it, and we need to ask the Holy Spirit to teach it. So, signing off, Neil, you can in here with Rock Our World.